Well, I'm pleased to be with you. <laughs> have to define what we mean. Uh, I mean, I'm just just feel that it would have been so lovely to be together because you all seem very very nice, and it would have been a lovely time. But of course, paradoxically, um, I suppose not all of us would have been able to make the journey to Galway anyways. And it's strange, isn't it? There are a lot of paradoxical situations at this moment in time, and um. That's sort of what I want to address, yes, towards uh, an architecture of enjoyment in dark times. I'm going to try and share my screen. All right. Partage it up. Here we go. Is that all right for everyone? Yeah, we can see yeah. it. Perfect. Yeah, that's fine. Excellent. Right, I've started off. I don't quite know why I've adopted this style but I, I've started there's several bits to the short paper but it started off as a sort of fiction sort of so a little bit of creative writing I suppose and then so there's a little section that's called once upon a time then there's another section which is called from traditional terraces to ephemeral terraces and then and then there's another bit which is a more sort of theoretical sort of pontification <laughs> Um, so I'll start off and I'll, I'll try and read it slowly. So here we go. Once upon a time, there were cafes, some very grand, with terraces where, by the way, it's the given of this story, you have the money, you could sit and watch the world pass by. The, the terrace was a licensed extension of the establishment of which you were the cherished client but you were also in the city, almost at one with the ordinary folk going about their business. But not quite. You are paying for the difference between you and them. You have not ordered your coffee at the counter, but are paying more for being on terrasse. Then, then it stopped. It partly came back for a few months with the apparition of ephemeral terraces in the summer of 220, but differently. No longer a mere extension of the establishment, often usurping the place of cars as well as pedestrians. These ephemeral terraces were often composed of more than a few tables and chairs placed outside. They were sometimes temporary DIY constructions. That's not a very good example. Maybe it's more that. Often wooden, sometimes surrounded by plants, palm trees, suggestive of beach huts in exotic places. Because of social distancing rules, there was more space. Tables were spread out. You could spread yourself. It all felt a little bit alternative, more improvised, somehow freer, make-believe like playing at being in a restaurant whilst being properly out in the street. Of course, it favoured faster but cheaper food and thereby a bit more of a throwaway culture, which was unfortunate, but it felt more popular, sort of. The homeless had strangely disappeared. All right, the next section. From tra traditional terraces, to ephemeral terraces and then. I'll just finish this. Before these COVID times, we'd seen the other version coming. For 20 years now, Allo Resto had been campaigning for the advantages of ordering home deliveries, encouraging our fantasies, for they are our fantasies, aren't they? of just being ourselves, whilst also taking full advantage of what is available out there, still being served, not having to cook for oneself. All that remains the same, but there are added advantages. Thanks to Allo Resto and our others like them, we can now, as it were, eat out, but not have to dress or even eat out while undressing, 
both options not normally available when in the public realm. Before, when we went to a restaurant, which of course we all did, didn't we? We more or less had to get dressed, even dressed up. It was a real drag. With home delivery, Allo Resto reassured us we can just suit ourselves, do exactly what and when and how we like. No etiquette or rituals involved. It's much better. We don't even have to care if the children behave badly. No need to worry about disturbing others. We are amongst ourselves, but doing our own thing. Fully licensed social behaviour, just as it should be. Let's remind us, remind ourselves of how it used to be before being able to do what we like. What an antiquated world. Indeed, as Hua told us years ago, one needed courage in those days to go shopping. One also needed to be a bit stupid, like those ridiculous communists. All that misplaced hero heroism, pushing and shoving vast heavy trolleys, when it can all be so much easier. Just an effortless click, or at least for us. All right. At least, at least for us, there's no need to look any further. When we are finally post-COVID, will we ever be post-COVID? Are we going to look any further? What will remain? What will remain now fully in place, and what will we lose? What could we gain in the sense of doing things differently? Spatio temporarily organizing ourselves differently. The ephemeral terraces were no doubt a mere epiphenomenon. To read them as a counter hemogenomic as a, as a strategy would be um, a travesty. In any case, they had official permission to go ahead and occupy quasi liminal spaces, the edges of pavements, the gutters, and what would otherwise be parking spaces. Nevertheless, is there any way they could possibly figure as a symbol of what Bloch called the difficult melodious sound? This is German for you. Den schwierigen Wohlklang. I mean, what a language. Wohlklang. The difficult melodious sound. The earthly paradise he suggests we are searching for. Some kind of better balance between the public and the private, between ourselves and other humans. Some sort of, and this is Lefebvre, reclaimed immediacy. It's a long shot with this example, but I'm at this point clutching at straws. My fear is that sight will be lost of wider issues, those that go beyond the global human health crisis, such as those relating to the climate crisis, but not just. And that as a, as a situation drags on and on, and all that, all that the many will care to remember, those brief moments of jouissance, such as the ephemeral terraces, or when, or when we could hear the, the famous moments when we could hear the birds sing in cities like Paris, those brief moments of respite from worries and uncertainty during the pandemic, those moments that also seem somehow different and even otherworldly, all the rest will be forgotten in the relief to return to a supposed normal normality. As Lukas, Lukas Stanek explains in his, reduction, in his introduction to Towards an Architecture of Enjoyment, for Lefebvre, space was not just merely conceived or perceived, something abstracted or purely representational, but something lived and, yes, enjoyed in the process of organic unfolding. Jouissance is the living, breathing subject engaging in the world completely and fully. Lefebvre refused to totally write off tourist new towns such as Benidorm as sheer products of commodifying consumer culture, suggesting that the space of leisure tends, but it's no more than a tendency, a tension, a transgression of users in search of a way forward to surmount divisions. The division between social and mental, the division between sensual, sensory and intellectual, and also the division between the everyday and the out of the ordinary festival. 
This space further reveals where the vulnerable areas and potential breaking points are. Everyday life, the urban sphere, the body, the, and the differences that emerge, that emerge within the body repeti repetitions from gestures, rhythms, or cycles. The space of leisure bridges the gap between traditional spaces with their monumentality and their localizations based on work and its demands and potential spaces of enjoyment and joy. In consequence, this space is the very epitome of contradictory space. This is where the existing modes of production produce both its worst and its best. Parasitic outgrowths on the one side, on the one hand, and exuberant branches on the other, as prodigal of monstrosities as of promises that it cannot keep. Is there any way that Lefebvre's comments can be applied to my very weak example of the ephemeral terraces? We might balk at them, at the idea of them surmounting differences, given that I am based on my example in Paris, already a privileged place compared to many Bonlieu, for instance. However, those Parisians who could have, could, had largely deserted the city to go to their secondary homes. Though it could, should be pointed out that it's not just the rich who have family homes in the countryside in France. Those who were left were probably paying an exorbitant price even for a tiny apartment. The ephemeral terraces may be provided the occasion to really take advantage of being a city dweller, a form of reclaiming what one might not have been able to enjoy fully up to, up to now. Cities can be congested, claustrophobic, stressful places. There's something to be said for sitting out. Oh my dear, have a look again. For sitting out, taking one's time, breaking the code somewhat, reinscribing one's body into the city, between the cars, between the bins, between the parking meters, making a holiday of it all. But yes, this is a, this is Lefebvre, I'm quoting, ridiculous, distorted, awkward form of liberation, a travesty. We're still very much in the realm of commodification. The ephemeral terraces were, after all, probably only astute, astute ways of attracting clients outdoors, given that serving inside was forbidden. Yet maybe there is nevertheless, there's nevertheless, is a re, there's a recuperable fantasy of social transformation at work in these transitory place spaces. For Lefebvre, concrete utopia begins with the jouissance and seeks to conceive of a new space. We are all looking very hard at these ambiguous terraces. <laughs> Maybe someone can, contact, can detect a sign of refusal that the daily boulot, metro, dodo, work, tube, bed routine is not enough. That enjoyment in the city should be more accessible to all. To function critically, these spaces of leisure would have to reveal the contradictions between abstract, abstract space, defined as simultaneously homogenous and fragmentary, the product, instrument, means and milieu of post-war capitalism and the possibility of its other. As that, as that other, the ephemeral terraces, were at the very least proof that space does not always have to be paid for, officially licensed out, that even in dense, compact cities, there is still porosity. Oops. Yeah, all right, all right. I'm almost at the end, got 15 sentences. Uh, that even in dense, compact city, cities there's still porosity as benjamin on naples there's still spaces that can be appropriated that constructions can be temporary installations even carried out more or less by amateurs not everything has to be codified and regulated that people take pleasure in adapting that they enjoy improvising that they can be content with simple sensual pleasures in a social environment I don't know, but it seems to me that given that we are weirdly suspended and no doubt feeling disoriented, even before of all of this, probably anxious about the future, there might be something to be said at this moment in time, given that everything is so blatantly out of sync, for reconsidering Lefebvre's notion of uh, rhythm, rhythm analysis, the rhythms of my life, of night and day, of my fatigue and activity, individual, biological and cosmic. I suppose we could conclude by saying that the relics of the ephemeral terraces should, could figure meta metaphorically like empty parentheses that could potentially be filled were we to find the energy to think imaginatively 
aren't we all so exhausted? But we need to start doing it now before those spaces are closed down by a return to supposed normality. For surely that will be the official discourse. Voila. That's me clapping. Oh. Thanks, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, especially like this once upon a time, there were cafes. <laughs> yes. you know, it was brilliant. Uh, um, now we move on to uh, Professor Nicole Paul. She's also editor of the Utopian Studies Journal. And uh, uh, Nicole uh, is going to present her paper, quote, in the burning house, uh, language remains, which is a quote from Agamben 2020. So over to you, Nicole. Hi, morning, Zurika. Hi, <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Okay. Um, and I echo Diane, my friend Diane's um, feelings we just want to be in Galway don't we and I share yes. a secret with you is that my my utopia is actually Inish Man. this is where I want to live secretly <laughs> no I've given it away but there we are we can't do it this is the next one and thanks Diane actually my link to Diane's paper is is the, the kind of thinking a little bit about thinking imaginatively um, in the world that we live in so I will also try to share a screen. This is not the reason why I had problems this morning is this is not my computer. So I'm just fiddling around. Mm. Can you see anything? Yes. I guess this is your screen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Diane is like, no. Yeah, Diane. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, way now. Yes, excellent. Hours later, <laughs> my computer broke. You can see how dependent we are on technology, which is just not good. Anyway, um, I wanted to share some thoughts about spaces, about imagination today, which I um, have started developing about two years ago, and I still haven't got an answer, which I guess is that's how it is with this matter of where we live in. Um, and I started off really with this kind of reflection some years ago, if we can have utopia without humans, right? And I also haven't got an answer to that one, so I'm kind of sidetracked a little bit. What I want to think about today is um, is the usefulness of utopian thought, utopian imagination in the world that we find ourselves in. And again, this is just to throw some things at you. It's not to come up with answers. Mm -hmm. The world has been through an extraordinary, rather Old testament -y year, I think we can all agree on that. We not only had a global pandemic, we hear about this every day, we hear less about the waves of locusts that descended into Africa last year, where even the reporter, the BBC reporter said, this is very much the Old Testament. This is the text that we need to read now. We have, we had, and we still have, as we all know, eruptions of volcanoes. We have the awful wildfires in Australia, floods. I mean, we can just continue with the catalogue of, of environmental crises. And I do add the global pandemic to an environmental crisis because I see a direct link be between these zoonotic diseases and environmental um, destruction. So we seem to have arrived at the terminus of time's arrow, to quote Stephen Gold, um, the end of human life as we know it. So how can utopian utopian thinking as a speculative art accelerate change, provide ideas around change, provide visions of a different world, maybe even a better world? I'm not sure, I'm quite skeptical, but I'm not quite ready to let go of hope completely, or shall we say, in fact, to let go of meaning of our lives as well. And to quote Frank Kermode, to make tolerable one's moment between beginning and end. So between beginning and death, I guess. And we all know that meaning and hope are indeed 
two different things. In Hunting for Hope, Scott Sanders writes that the first condition of hope is to believe that you will have a future. The second is to believe that there will be a decent world in which to live in. Now, at this point, I would argue is that we're not sure about either point. So what does this mean for utopias, utopian thinking, utopian thought? Everything must change so that nothing remains the same. What does that mean? How would that look like? And how can we bring about change, this kind of radical change? How do we generate and maintain hope or meaning, if not hope, meaning that will fuel radical change that will allow us to hope for a future in a decent world? Is this at all possible, feasible or necessary in fact? In his piece on COVID-19, Agamben rightly asked, and this is where I got the, the paper quote from as well, there is no sense in anything I do if the house burns down. So we might as well just leave it. Well, you could argue that in the greater scheme of things, we do not matter that much. If we take the viewpoint of deep time to qualify the importance of humans in Earth histories, the Anthropocene becomes a mere boundary event. And I'm um, re referring here Haraway, of course. Or indeed, as Katie Mack explored in the end of everything, astrophysically speaking, our universe will be obliter obliterated eventually. I wish I could pronounce that word. Humans and non-human species will adapt up to a point, but then everything will be gone. Sorry, this is not very um, positive on crack of early morning, is it? <laughs> But our universe, she says, will be obliterated eventually. Humans and non-human species will adapt up to a point, but then everything will be gone. The cosmic end times will bring no day of judgment, no redemption, and climate destruction will just accelerate this process. So if and how can utopias and utopian thought be at all relevant, useful? And kind of linking it to the theme of this conference or this workshop is how can the arts generate utopian desire, build new and different societies from the ruins around us, or at least give meaning to life? Is utopian desire now futile and in fact illusory creating merely a supposedly happy, harmonious and non-conflictual space that serves to soothe and mollify and entertain us. And this is citing David Harvey. In fact, is utopian desire not a form of distraction from possible climate collapse and extinction? Or as Claire Colbrook calls it, toxic hope. Hope, she says, can be intoxicating in its capacity to disorient and to open up a world beyond the given, beyond the who we are. Or hope can be toxic, precluding us from acting and living in the now, directing our attention to an imagined, imagined future that will render the present inauthentically tolerable. And I think that's a really brilliant extinction. And we have the same ambivalence with utopia. As the brilliant China Mieville argues, utopia has its limits. Utopia can also be toxic. And he says, utopias are necessary, but not only are they insufficient, they can in some iterations be part of the ideology of the system the bad totality that organizes us, warms the skies and condemns millions to peonage on garbage screen. And I think what he refers to here, and he makes a point um, that um, the kind of universalist utopian thought and, and vision is, is deeply problematic, toxic, in fact. 
So in this train of thought, the radical potential of utopia and actually also dystopia is as best reduced to a mere means of social political critique that can be answered with concrete political reforms or at worst abused as political spin and ideology. But I want to turn the focus onto the idea of imagination and speculation as well, and ethical witnessing to, to answer these um, condemnations of utopian thinking. I don't agree with the idea that utopian thought is there to soothe and mollify us. Utopia and utopianism are about common humanity, having visions for a different, possibly better future and better societies where we find climate justice, for instance, social justice. Utopias are not about individual dreams of what would I do if I win the lottery? I think we could also all answer that one, but it won't um, rectify the problems we find ourselves in. I think the problem lies elsewhere. Can we really hope for a future and a better society? Now, Rutger Bretman, who um, wrote a couple of years ago a book called Utopias for Realists, quite rightly underscores that we lack, in fact, the imagination. And this is a reference to Diane's paper. We can't come up with anything better, not only for ourselves, but also for the planet, for the human and non-human species alike. Imagination really asking questions, asking difficult questions, and in fact, the right questions, creating new narratives as well, would aid us to come up with something better. Now, Drusilla Cornell wrote in 2017 about the decline of public imagination during the Trump government. And she referenced the philosopher Spinoza here. She underscores that imagination is always collective, that we are affected by others in a true democracy that allows, and I cite her here, the greatest expression of different images and different material engagement. So it's about the connecting with others and being truly open to other people's experiences. A similar thought, in fact, um, has been developed also by George Monbiot and then Rob Hopkins as well, the founder of the transition movement in his latest book, From What Is to What If, unleashing the power of imagination to create the future we want. And this links also quite nicely to Diane's Once Upon a Time, which is evocative but critical and kind of catapults us into a collective imagination. So to recreate a rich collective imagination means to ourselves new contact with each other, of course, not to exclude and build walls between countries, but also, and I go back here to Donna Haraway, to connect truly with non-human species. And she calls this to make kin. We need to acknowledge that we are all kin, humans and non-species together. In The Burning House, Agamben insists, language remains. A poem written in The Burning House is truer, more right, because no one can hear it, because nothing ensures that it can escape the flames. But if, if by chance it finds a reader, then that reader will in no way be able to draw back from the apostrophe that calls out from that helpless, inexplicable, faint clamor only someone who's unlikely ever to be heard can tell the truth. Only someone who speaks from within a house that the flames are relentlessly consuming. Agamben here, as far as I understand it, um, talks about a true human language, an honest one, a language infused with poetry and philosophy, testimony to extinction and death. 13 minutes. This is, as I understand, a form of ethical witnessing. The ethical element holds the utopian desire, 
the witnessing reveals the dystopian components of a world in which we witness many conflicting dystopian scenarios narratives. An ethical witnessing can take place without hope in the face of extinction. And indeed hope is not the opposite of, but is in dialectical relationship with hopelessness. It fuels, as Benjamin Haas suggests, revolutionary critical hopelessness. <coughs> Excuse me. If we pursue this train of thought, Utopian thought is embedded in revolutionary and critical hopelessness. And indeed the dialectic between hope and hopelessness must be experienced, felt and sensed. For Haas then, revolutionary critical hope and hopelessness moves from being, and he talks about performances here, an aesthetic event to an art practice that is ultimately a practice of activism. And I'm not sure, Zorica, if I've got time to show a two minute clip of a little video. It's, I'm sorry, well, I can just yeah. say, uh, we, we prefer just having shorter presentations and uh, actually if there's anything you wish to show, you can do it in the discussion part if you don't mind. Perfect, Perfect. So, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I had just a short video by the Red Rebel Brigade uh -huh. as a kind okay. of example of where performance becomes political activism. So I want to just stop here. We will have to die, I guess, as individuals, most possibly as species. The question is how we fill the interval between the beginning and the end, the midst, and give it meaning, even as transhuman or post-human beings in a post-nature, post-apocalyptic and post-human world. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I can put the little video clip later on in the chat, so. Mm. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, thanks for reminding us of the state of affairs in this burning house of ours, <laughs> if I may say so. Um, we have to move on to uh, Dr. Soterius Triantaphilus. Um, Soterius uh, holds a PhD in history from Oxford University on the subject of early modern utopia and science. Uh, and uh, his book, The Social and Cultural Conception of Space in Early Modern European Utopia, is due to be published this year. Uh, the title of uh, uh, Sotirius's presentation is The Gardeners of Dystopia, Doomsaying in the 21st Century's Climate Fiction and the Dogmatization of Catastrophe. Welcome, Sotirius. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you uh, for the audience and of course, uh, the esteemed company uh, and the wonderful previous presentations. Um, mine, you know, well, I'm a historian, I'm a simpler creature, but um, my presentation is linked with the themes of catastrophe and the themes of uh, post-apocalypse and apocalypse. We live in post-apocalyptic time. Let me open my presentation and share it. Uh, let me find it first. Here it is. Um, so let me uh, close my camera in order to have my panic attack while I'm reading it to some dignity. Uh, excuse me for that. Uh, let's see if it's ready. Can everyone see it? Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks, wonderful. Well, as you can see from this not very short title, my theme is about how climate fiction works perceive an emerging trend in our culture. The possibility that we have, that we are condemned to live through a dystopian era without any end in its future. Pessimism, of course, perme permeates sorry, many visions of the future, whether they are found in dystopias, science fiction, or climate fiction in this, uh, in this era. This pessimism inspires narratives with an alarmist and catastrophic attitude. Attitudes that in our time, of course, as I said, are expressed by Clive 5 
Based, based on this very simple fact, I understand the contemporary climate fiction as a dystopian genre, genre and as such, I'm going to analyze it in this very short paper, I hope. Well, focusing especially on the unique way it employs the concept of the apocalypse. However, if cli-fi is, as I argue, the main dystopian expression of our age, it is necessary to understand what this moniker really means. Cli-fi is a fairly recent term being coined only in 2013 to describe an influx of novels that were preoccupied with themes evolving around climate change and its impact on humanity. A very loosely identified body of literature that can be called genre all for convenient reasons due to its lack of both the unique uh, stylistic conventions and the plot formulas that define genre liter literature. This makes cli-fi extremely malleable and suitable for experimentations by authors who wish to explore the impact of climate change in the future of our planet and civilization. Most of them are doing this by combining their treatments of climate change and catastrophe with plot elements borrowed from genres like horror or crime, usually producing a unique mixture of popular science, climate change anxiety, and pulp fiction in many respects dominate by depictions of a future world plagued by poverty, war, and social collapse. A world in constant, in constant turmoil and decline due to humanity's failure to mitigate climate change. This idea of humanity's failure really is the plot element that bonds every different strand of cli-fi. A failure that in these narratives takes the form of a major climate disaster, a coming apocalypse that comes to plague humanity eternally until its end. While this stance echoes current perception of climate change and most importantly contemporary criticism about the reluctance to deal with this issue, we must be mindful of the ambiguity of apocalypse as a concept and especially its frequent employment in the past in utopian literature. Apocalyptic disasters can also be cathartic events. In other words, an apocalypse is an easy way or it was an easy way to liberate humanity from its past sins, to give it an absolution in order to move on ushering a new chapter in history, while its ferocity as a punishment forces humanity to re-evaluate re its moral code, to change its ways. In some 20th century protocol fireworks, the trope of apocalypse was employed exactly in this way. Nevertheless, contemporary cli-fi is in many respects the product of 1970 scientific discourse about climate change and the wider public concerns that it generates. One where as I said, an alarmist and pessimistic attitude was dominant. For this reason, Clifi's origins are traced back to the 1970s. At the same time, when concerns about the greenhouse effects impact on the planet's climate were dominating both public environmental discourse and human collective fears. In particular, in particular uh, uh, Le Guin's novel, The Last of Heaven, is credited as the first Clifi in the modern sense of the word, of the genre. A work that describes the dystopian future where humanity tests the results, tastes the results of major environmental collapse, such as war, poverty, and deadly weather phenomena. The lack of heaven is distinguished by Le Guin's nuanced take on climate change impact and her avoidance of dramatic imagery. Yet the period's environmental discourse was dominated by an apocalyptic rhetoric, with numerous works of popular science predicting major environmental collapses and the subsequent destruction of humanity. Maybe the most characteristic of them was Paul Ehrlich's Population Bomb, pub published in 1968, a work, a work that utilized the predictions of the United Nations about population rise and food production stagnation due to environmental collapse to describe a future where climate and Malthusian apocalypse combine their force to wipe out humanity from the face of Earth. Mass media, but also environmental activists, readily adopted this sensationalist. Uh, sensation, sorry, this sensationalist. Uh, I'm really sorry about that. Rhetoric. It's for its own reasons. The first, because reporting a catastrophe was drawing audiences and it was much easier to present than to explain how climate change would be a multi generational phenomenon. And the second, because they were betting on its shock value to draw support to their cause. Apocalyptic language was used to emphasize the inevitability 
of a world ending disaster, hoping to force both the public and the elites to act up. Thus, it came to dominate every medium and discourse that is occupied with this issue, either scientific, political, or cultural. A representative example of this tendency can be found in the frequent rhetorical device that accompanies every United Nations framework convention on climate change. It's our planet's last chance. We should not be critical to this employment of the apocalyptic trope because it was a form of enlightened catastrophe, as the French philosopher Jean-Pierre Dupuy calls it. A narrative strategy that focuses on the possibility of a world betting disaster to re-engage an apathetic public. Today's, today's apathy or even outright difference to climate change justifies this attitude. Furthermore, enlightened, enlightened catastrophism is quite similar in its function to what scholars of utopianism like Tom Oyland understand as the role of some critical dystopias that function as clandestine narratives of resistance to an added utopian pessimism. We cannot be sure if the authors that engaged in the past decades with Clify were motivated by sheer desperation or by clandestine optimism. But 21st century Clify employs the dystopian tropes in a far more negative and reductive way. Serious, I'm sorry. So serious. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I just want to say your presentation is still on the first slide. Not sure if that's uh, on purpose or... Uh, I mean, no worries. Really? We... No, it should have changed. Let, let me... Ah, uh, well, technology. Mm -hmm. uh, let me <laughs> try again, maybe. First of all, I'm not sure if you are seeing that. Yes, we can mm. see Clifi as genre, no, apocalypse wave as a wave life. Mm. Let's see if now it moves. Now, is it working? Um. Can you see them changing? No. Ah, wonderful. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Mm. Well, if anyone wishes, I can share that. I think your presenter view might be open, perhaps on another on another screen. If you if you double check your screen sharing again. Uh, let me see again. Share. Hmm. Not working. Not so, working. do you see different screens now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Finally. Just not in slideshow mode, but that doesn't matter that much. Well, I'm really sorry about that. You know, I have no clue what I'm doing wrong. It's no problem at all. We can still follow the presentation just with you talking yes. anyway, so you can just continue. Sorry for that. I'm really I'm sorry for that. Well, where has been? Uh, so 21st century Clify employs the dystopian tropes in a far more negative and reductive way. In our current moment, while we navigate an era of pessimism about our society's future and capitalistic and an endless capitalistic crisis, the phantom of a biblical catastrophe that cannot be averted weighs us down, suffocating every utopian hope. And this is exemplified in climate fiction and especially on its... If now can change them in some way. Can you see the slides changing now? Yes. No. Yes. Ah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hooray. Mm -hmm. ah, well, so, and this is exemplified in climate fiction, especially on its refocus from the possibility of an apocalypse to the documentation of post apocalypse, becoming in many respects the chronicle of a catastrophe relying on climate science and its prediction models to support its inevitability. The scientific discourse informs Clify even when its writers wish to avoid reductive. Due, due to this, they remain in constant dialogue with the real phenomenon of climate change, always working under its shadow, a shadow that reminds them that this apocalypse cannot be interpreted as an allegory or to be pushed further behind by calendar calculation. This has led to a fatalism, where the narrative's focus switches from stories that usually present centuries-long procedures of adaptation to climate change to ones that concentrated on an apocalyptic event or its aftermath. Indeed, my analysis focused on two 
fairly recent dystopian climate fiction work, Margaret Atwood's Madadam, as you can see, hopefully, in the picture, and Omar El Khad's American War, that describes stories of survival in a post apocalyptic world. Both works occupy a gray zone, in particular, neither engage directly with the causes of climate collapse in their fictional world, both using it as a core element for their setting upon which every kind of personal, social, and political disaster unfolds. The problem with this strategy is that it loses its focus on climate change and especially the scientific arguments around it. However, I think it signifies something much more important, its acceptance of the impending climate disaster almost as a natural phenomenon, a recognition that apocalypse won't be averted and we must learn to live with it. It is no coincidence that both look like a collection of dystopian motifs. Atwood, who in her trilogy had ample space to develop her universe, gave us a world that surrendered to multinational conglomerates where poverty, violence, and environmental collapse is the new normal. Yet her trilogy story arc revolves around an engineered pandemia by a scientist who wished to replace humanity with, envir with environmentally friendly humanoids called the Krakers. The novel presents a world in endless crisis that looks like the worst scenarios of Ehrlich or James Hansen, another uh, scientist, scientist and author of popular uh, science works dealing with climate change and its 13 minutes. 13 minutes, okay, 13 minutes. Uh, sorry, I have to... Still, the author avoids commenting upon any of this, preferring to focus on her characters. Climate disaster, neoliberal corrupt regime, everything is taken as part of the natural order of things. Jim the Snowman, the caretaker of the Krakers, along with Toby and Zeb, members of the God's Gardeners, a cult that prayed for the end of the world, are survivors of a human civilization that had been a stalemate for so long that had deteriorated to such an extent that triggering a cataclysmic event was the only choice left. Madadam trilogy evokes the theme of apocalypse using imagery and the vocabulary associated with cataclysm. cataclysm. For example, the plague that devastated the human population is called waterless flood. In the end, a few electrons seem to have survived the apocalypse, something that can be perceived as a statement of optimism about humanity's potential to survive, but can be easily interpreted as the ultimate failure to escape from the dystopian impasse. Survival is not survey, salvation, but penance. Omar el Khad voiced exactly the same thing in his work. American War deals with the aftermath of a second civil war in America and the refusal of the South to adopt a legislation that was going to total of fossil fuels. Yet our narrator and his aunt, who is the main protagonist of the novel, never deal directly with this issue. Well, I don't have much time yet. Let me draw some conclusions. Even if there is a strong temptation to dismiss these narratives as pure miser miserabilism, we must consider how they echo perfectly our age of desperation by depicting futures where multiple catastrophes coalesce. What makes both distinct is not the way that they chose to depict the results of climate change, but the narrowing of expectations about our future and what that about our future that they express. Their decision to avoid to comment on climate change results should not be interpreted only as a rejection of the Dutchism that usually plagues environmental narratives, but as a conscious decision to accept that our cosmos is one where an erotic shoreline gradually will destroy our home and we won't be able to do anything about it. This is the most powerful method that, that permits these works, and this is probably the most tangible mark of our dystopian era.